In this segment, we're going to talk about the medical management of diabetes. We'll start off by reviewing the physiology and associated pathophysiology of glucose, glucose homeostasis. We'll discuss the major categories of drugs used to treat diabetes and discuss the ADA recommendations for the diagnosis and management, medical management of diabetes. Uh, so insulin is about, uh, or I'm sorry, diabetes is about uh, a disruption of glucose homeostasis. Glucose is about five millimolar in the blood or uh, less than 100 milligrams per deciliter. It's pretty tightly regulated. We need glucose in the blood in order to power respiration, particularly for the brain. And if we have hypoglycemia with low levels of, of glucose in the blood, uh, we can start to experience cognitive uh, problems with um, you know, uh, uh, loss of cognitive function and ultimately we can pass out. Um, if, if glucose levels are low, that's sensed by the pancreas and the pancreas releases glucagon. Glucagon signals the liver to increase the breakdown of glycogen and the production of new glucose that is then released in the bloodstream in order to br bring blood glucose levels back to normal. Now, if glucose levels are high, like they are after a meal, that is sensed by the pancreas as well, and the pancreas releases insulin. And insulin acts on a number of different peripheral tissues, including adipose tissue, muscle, and the liver. In order to increase the uptake of glucose, to increase the synthesis of glycogen, which is the storage form of glucose, and to decrease the production of new glucose in the liver. So all of these actions together tend to take glucose out of the bloodstream and return blood glucose levels from that high level back to normal. Now, obviously, diabetes is a disruption of that side of the signal. And um, the disruption can happen in a couple of different places. Um, we can have a defect in the production of insulin. And certainly in type 1 diabetes, that is the primary defect, where uh, through some uh, problem, generally an autoimmune uh, disruption, destruction of the beta cells, uh, the beta cells in the pancreas can no longer produce insulin. We can also have disruptions of the production of insulin in type 2 diabetes, uh, but it is the primary issue in type 1. A, a major factor in type 2 diabetes is that we have, you know, we can have normal insulin levels in type 2 diabetes, but we, the responsiveness, the sensitivity of the peripheral tissues to insulin is reduced. So even if we have a normal or even heightened uh, amount of insulin in the blood, the tissues are not uh, taking up that, the, the same level of glucose, so we have hyperglycemia. And hyperglycemia is not a very good thing, so there are a number of, of uh, both acute and chronic effects that we want to be uh, watchful for. Hyperglycemia is going to lead to an increased excretion of uh, glucose through the kidneys. Now that's going to set up an osmotic gradient that is going to facilitate the loss of fluid and electrolytes uh, from the blood in the urine. So it's going to increase the frequency and amount of urination, so polyuria, and that can lead to volume, volume depletion where we're losing fluid. There's also a metabolic shift away from the metabolism of carbohydrates to the metabolism of fats and proteins, and though that can lead to the release of ketones, and uh, that can lead to ketoacidosis. So the combination of volume depletion and ketoacidosis can lead to a diabetic coma, which can be fatal. There are also chronic consequences of hyperglycemia. And of course, the, you know, a major category of, of consequences is both micro and macrovascular disease, which can lead to an increased risk of myocardial infarction, stroke, can contribute to retinopathy, can contribute to poor wound healing and the risk for amputation. There's also neuropathies uh, that can be not only painful, but can also increase the risk of ulcer ulceration and, uh, and amputation. Diagnosis of diabetes is based on assessing the blood sugar. Uh, there are a couple of different ways that we can do it. Uh, probably the gold standard is to monitor hemoglobin A1C. So this is a measure of glycated hemoglobin in the blood. Now the percentage of glycated hemoglobin 
reflects the average blood glucose level over the previous two to three months. So it gives us a nice long view of somebody's glucose homeostasis. Normal levels are going to be less than 5.7%. Between 5.7 and 6.5% would be prediabetes, and 6.5 or above would be considered diabetes. Another way to diagnose uh, diabetes is with a fasting plasma glucose level above 126 milligrams per deciliter would be considered diagnostic for diabetes. And finally, the last test would be an oral glucose tolerance test where someone takes a controlled amount of glucose uh, and we monitor the blood glucose response to that. And if that is greater than 200 milligrams per deciliter, that would be considered diagnostic for diabetes. Well, so how do we manage uh, diabetes? Well, if this is the process where the pancreas uh, senses the increase in blood glucose and releases insulin, and that insulin acts on peripheral tissues, uh, one thing that we can do is we can just use insulin or insulin analogs to replace uh, the insulin or augment the insulin that is being produced by the body. And particularly in people with type 1 diabetes, that's the mainstay of therapy. And so those people may have insulin pumps that constantly, you know, that frequently uh, adjust the amount of insulin that is being released based on the amount of blood glucose. Um, we also use insulin in type 2 diabetes, but we have another, a couple of other medical strategies that we can use before we get to that point. Um, so we have a, a couple of drugs that can increase the production of insulin. So we, we can call those insulin stimulators. Uh, so sulfonylureas so were one of the early ones, a GLP-1 agonist and DPP-4 inhibitor. So we'll talk about what those are in a couple of slides. Another uh, strategy would be to increase the sensitivity of the peripheral tissues to insulin. Uh, so metformin is the classic example uh, of that. So that's another strategy, medical strategy, that we can use to help to manage diabetes. And then we have another strategy that has its primary action at the, at the kidneys. And we'll talk about each of these drugs in turn. So the management of diabetes, uh, and we're going to focus on type 2 diabetes because that's what our patient has. Uh, the hemoglobin A1C target for most adults is uh, less than 7%. Uh, for some people, we can be a little bit more restrictive and shoot for less than 6.5, but we increase the risk of hypoglycemia. For other people who are very sick, have very advanced disease, or maybe a short lifespan, we can be a little bit more lax. But around 7%, uh, below 7% is the target. Uh, the, the first line is comprehensive lifestyle management, um, but very shortly after that is metformin or glucophage. Uh, so metformin is a, a biguanide. So this has two actions that, uh, that help with uh, diabetes. Number one, it in inhibits glucose production in the liver. It also increases the sensitivity of the peripheral tissues to insulin. So that's going to, both of those effects are going to decrease blood glucose. There are some side effects, including GI issues, such as nausea and vomiting and diarrhea. Those are generally transient. Um, the other side effect that we need to watch for is lactic acidosis, particularly during exercise. So if somebody's exercising and they start to have some uh, cognitive issues or start to feel uh, confused or lethargic, uh, that would be a concern that we would, want, we would monitor for there. Metformin is really a mainstay of treatment. It's really a cornerstone. Uh, so basically all of the pathways show metformin as the first line and then the addition of other drugs on top of metformin uh, rather than the replacement of metformin uh, provided the patient can tolerate metformin. So if metformin is not enough and we need additional medications in order to bring the hemoglobin A1C down to below 7, uh, we can do it in a couple of different ways. Um, we would generally like to decrease the risk of hypoglycemia, because hypoglycemia can be very um, uh, serious, uh, can, can be fatal. Uh, so the first line of drugs generally are that we're going to try are these going to be are going to be these categories of drugs that have low risk of hypoglycemia. One of those drugs is what we call a GLP-1 agonist or a glucagon-like peptide 1 agonist. Now glucagon-like peptide 1 is a hormone that's released from the GI tract after we eat a meal. And what it does is it enhances the ability of blood glucose to stimulate the release of insulin. Uh, 
So a, a GLP-1 agonist is a drug that exogenously uh, introduced that mimics this hormone. Uh, it is injectable, uh, so sometimes it is reserved for later on in the course of therapy, but uh, there, are some, there are some side effects that include GI issues, but there are also potentially some cardiovascular uh, protective effects, and it can also help to stimulate weight loss. So for certain patients, uh, this can be a really useful drug. Now, glucagon-like peptide stimulates the production of insulin uh, by the pancreas. DPP-4, uh, which is an enzyme, dipeptidyl peptidase 4, that's an enzyme that breaks down GLP-1. So if we inhibit the action of that enzyme, that allows GLP-1 to stick around for longer and to stimulate the production of more insulin. So a DLP, uh, DPP-4 inhibitor is also going to increase the supply of insulin. Uh, these are oral drugs, and they're generally well tolerated. So uh, these are uh, can be very useful in the management of uh, hyperglycemia. The other category of drugs, or another category of drugs that has a low risk of hypo, hypoglycemia, I'm hesitant to say the word because I always mess it up. Thiazolidinediamines. Um, these increase the sensitivity of the peripheral tissues to insulin. So they act by a different mechanism from the previous two, but they also have a low risk of hypoglycemia. Um, these are oral medications. Uh, they do require several months to reach their full effect, so it is a much more, uh, s much slower onset than some of the other drugs. There is also an increased risk of side effects, hepatic toxicity, lactic acidosis, edema, weight gain, and fractures. So this is... Um, probably becoming less popular uh, for the management of diabetes than some of the other drugs because of this risk of side effects. Uh, some side effects that we need to be uh, aware of is edema, obviously lactic acidosis we talked about, and fracture. So if somebody's taking this drug and they are reporting pain that might be consistent with a fracture, uh, that would be a flag where we would want to consult with another medical professional. Um, another drug that has a low risk of hypoglycemia is this SGL2 inhibitor. So this is the sodium glucose co-transporter 2. Um, now, this drug would block the activity of this sodium glucose co-transporter. Now, what that's going to do is it's going to prevent the reabsorption of glucose in the kidney. So we're going to lose more glucose in the urine. Um, and we talked about that being a bad thing, leading to volume depletion and diabetic uh, ketoacidosis or a diabetic coma. Um, but we can hopefully, with this drug, control that a little bit better. Um, so there is a risk of hypotension, uh, but with controlled doses, uh, we, can, we can minimize that risk. Uh, it is an oral drug. It may enhance weight loss. Uh, which is a problem for many people with diabetes, uh, type 2 diabetes in particular. Uh, it's going to increase urination, which may be problematic for some people. Uh, it's going to increase the risk of yeast infections uh, in females, and we already talked about the risk of hypotension because we are increasing the loss of uh, glucose and fluid uh, through the urine. SGL2s are a relatively new category of drugs uh, for the treatment of, of diabetes, but um, uh, they, they do seem to hold some promise. Now, if we have tried metformin and lifestyle changes, and we've tried some of these other drugs and we've still not had an effect, um, there are additional categories of drugs that we can use. Uh, so sulfonylureas are some of the earlier drugs. Um, one of the, the glipizide and glyburide, those are second generation uh, sulfonylureas. The big risk here is hypoglycemia. Um, and hypoglycemia can be, uh, like I said before, uh, can be deadly. So the second generation are more potent. We can use a smaller amount and hopefully decrease the risk of hypoglycemia. These are oral drugs. They're relatively cheap, so if cost is an issue, they might be uh, used. Um, there are some GI issues and headache and dizziness. Um, and then, of course, insulin. There are several different uh, preparations of insulin. Um, most of them are injectable. Uh, 
Uh, again, the risk of hypoglycemia with insulin uh, is, um, is high. Uh, it is generally, I wouldn't say it's the last line of defense, but generally we uh, move through some of the other drugs before we start to use insulin. Now, the PT implications for the use of these drugs is we need to monitor for hyperglycemia. Hypoglycemia, sorry, I misspoke there. Um, so particularly during exercise, because in general, exercise is going to decrease blood sugar. Uh, so headache, fatigue, hunger, tachycardia, sweating, anxiety, and confusion are all signs and symptoms that would suggest hypoglycemia. Uh, now, if you suspect hypoglycemia, you can ask the person uh, to check their blood sugar if, uh, if they can. Um, if hypoglycemia is present, then you'd want to treat that with glucose or some other carbohydrate. Here's a table from the American Diabetes Association uh, guidelines. It's really tough to read right here, but I've given you the link. Uh, this kind of lists the, the different... Uh, kind of risks and indications of all the drugs that we've just talked about. So what are the clinical implications here? Well, when we have a patient with diabetes who is being medically managed, we want to ask people whether they know what their blood sugar levels are and, and are they monitoring that? Um, and are they in the target range? Uh, whether they're taking their meds? And if they've had signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia, particularly if they take uh, insulin or sulfonylureas. And again, keep in mind that exercise is going to tend to lower blood sugar. So if somebody's coming in the door with very low blood sugar, we might want to um, either delay exercise or have them uh, eat a meal or something in order to prevent hypoglycemia during the, the exercise. Here's some references. This American Diabetes Association Standards of Medical Care a uh, really useful resource. The, the ADA page has a wealth of resources.